Washington. How's everybody tonight? Good? Feels like the light is brighter than usual. Is that possible to not be? <laughs> While we're talking, you introduce, talk amongst yourselves, talk uh, people to the left of you and to the right of you, in front of you and behind you, say hello. Hey. We should have left. Uh, and, and Krista, would you ask them these lights are very bright tonight? I don't know. I got a lot of mileage out of it. Yeah, thank you. 25. Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> okay. And hello to those of you who are watching via live stream. Are you ready? Let's take a deep breath, close our eyes. <clears throat> we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. We see within this light the presence of God in whatever form or image appears to us, knowing that we have been drawn here together tonight in that presence. And we pray that God's most Holy Spirit be upon us, lifting us above and beyond the fears and limitations and sorrows of this world to the love and to the peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together we all say, Amen. <clears throat> in the introduction to A Course in Miracles, it says, the Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. And I want to take a moment to introduce Sharon Pierre-Louise, correct? Is that your name, Sharon? And then there's another lady named Mara Bassani who's going to be uh, up here, and they're doing sign interpretation for us tonight. So we welcome both of you, and thank you for being here. So it is our job to identify in order to remove our barriers to the awareness of love's presence. It says in The Course in Miracles, it is not your job to seek for love, but to seek within yourself all the barriers you hold against its coming. Now, what are these barriers that we hold against love's coming? They are core beliefs and they are behavioral patterns. Core beliefs that lead to behavioral patterns that then keep love at bay. We often think or talk in terms of finding love. I wish I could find love. Or you have to go out there and get it. Remember, time and space, as the Course says, and also Einstein, is itself, the entire idea of time and space are illusions of consciousness. There is no out there. Of Course in Miracles said one day you will realize there is nothing out there. Not only that, all that is real, all that is happening is love. You are love. And the universe itself, the handwriting of God, is made of love. You don't have to find love. The issue is to be willing to receive it and to be available to it when it comes. And when it comes is every single instant. So the issue is not that we haven't found love. The issue is how often love has not been able to find us. 
because who we are has been hiding from the love that's standing right there. And sometimes it's the very fact that love is standing right there that makes us hide. And that's what the ego mind is. The ego mind is the resistance to love based on the false belief that we are not love. And if we do not cultivate the idea that we are love, and we do not practically cultivate the idea that our function is to love, then the mental imagery and the mental power that is the truth of who we are and that is already programmed to extend itself out into the world because it was not given by us the conscious directive to serve love then serves that force which repudiates love or ego. And the form that takes is some fractal of personality. Now, it might be that you were dishonest, it might be that you're manipulative, it might be that you're hot, it might be that you're cold, it might be that you're angry, it might be that you're judgmental, it might be that you're needy, it might be that you're smothering. At this point in your life, you're probably aware of what your character defects are, you're probably aware of what your issues are, and if you're not, your best friends could tell you. So at a certain point, the issue is not that you don't know what it is you do every time. But there is something to the recognition that this illusion, this fairy tale that we tell ourselves, that we haven't had opportunities for love, we haven't had opportunities for work, we haven't had opportunities for this or opportunities for that, is nothing more than a story we tell ourselves. It's harder to face but much more liberating to face <clears throat> that opportunities for love and abundance on every level have come at us all the time, and yet we hide. And so once again, our job is not to seek for love, but to seek within ourselves all the barriers we hold against its coming. And those barriers are the walls in front of our heart that basically says to love, no, I'm not ready, no, I'm not available, no, I will not be here. Where did they come from? Most of the time, for most of us, something happened in childhood. Something happened where there was a break. It is as though wires get crossed. <clears throat> and then what ultimately emerges is some personality characteristic, i.e. character defects, where on some deep subconscious level, moments occur that trigger us. And in that place, in that moment, we don't know how to allow the love that is the truth of who we are extend through us. In that moment, we go into this spasm. It's like an, emo an emotional muscle spasm, an emotional muscle cramp. Where we don't in that moment feel like I can extend my love and still get my needs met. Now, the ego does not want us to see this. And if we do see it, the ego says, well, let's go back into the past to understand how you got this way. But the past is not where the healing lies. Because whatever the situation was in which that break occurred, the healing is in the present moment. You might say to a man who's in front of you, not that you would say it, maybe you're grown beyond the place where you would say it, but my thought is, I would like to cut your head off right now, I would like to bite your head off right this moment. <laughs> and you go to therapy and you talk about what it was about your father, and what it was about your experiences of the past that would make you want to say to this man standing in front of you on some level, just this anger that would come out. But The Course in Miracles says, that the savior at the moment is not in the past. The savior is in this moment in that man who's standing in front of you. Because the Course in Miracles says that we are only heir to the wounds of the past, which in this case would be the wounds of childhood, to the extent to which you identify with the person that went through that childhood experience. To the extent 
to which we shift our sense of self-perception and self-identification from our mortal history to our immortal timelessness, we are healed of those wounds because we are healed of the belief that the person who is wounded is who we are. So enlightenment, the Course says, is a shift in self-identification from body identification to spirit identification. So I, Marianne, was a child in a certain place with a particular history. And based on my particular history and my particular circumstances, I might have particular wounds that led to particular character defects. My story, your story, everybody's story. What the ego says is that if I understand that story well enough, that I will be able to heal that wound. And most of us know, no, if I understand that story well enough, all it means is I will be able to talk about it in a very sophisticated way with such complicated jargon that somebody who doesn't know this shit might think I'm actually healed. <laughs> so, The Course in Miracles talks about the recognition that the mortal story is not your story. That's why when we read the story of Buddha, we read the story of Moses. We read the story of Jesus. The great religious stories of the great religious figures do not just refer to actual people who lived thousands of years ago, although historically they did. But the great religious stories are coded messages which speak not to just the historical realities of particular people, but to the timeless psychic realities that apply to all of us all the time. Now, in this particular case, let's look at the story of Jesus. Look at the imagery of the crucifixion and the resurrection. The crucifixion, from a metaphysical perspective, is the energy pattern by which fear or ego seeks to replace by invalidation, trivialization, and direct attack that which is the love within you. In that moment when I am triggered, in that moment of, of character defect, where for whatever reason, we don't know how in that moment to express our love and get our needs met, that is our own ego seeking to crucify us and through this, crucify others. It is first seeking to attack you. It comes out as something you do to others, that you're selfish towards others, or you're smothering towards others, or you're controlling towards others, or you're angry towards others, whatever it is you do to other people. But the ego mind did not have as its goal primarily to attack them. The, goal, the ego had as its goal primarily to attack you. They have their own ego. If the ego is in charge, the ego is going to work through me to bring misery and suffering not only to me but to others as well. Just as the spirit in me, when the spirit is operative, is going to bring joy not only to me but joy to others. The image of the crucifixion is the metaphysical interpretation of the character defect. It is that place where the ego has you. The Course in Miracles says our two choices are to be host to God or hostage to the ego. Modern mentality, particularly in the West, aligns with this myth of neutrality. Well, I I don't want to help you, I, I don't want to love you, I don't want to serve you, I don't want to bless you, that's not my intention, but I mean, I don't want to hurt you. But the Course in Miracles says that there is nothing you can do to diminish your mental power because your mental power is who you are. You can't diminish it, you can only mismanage it. And that's what the ego mind is. When I forget who I am, I mismanage my power. When I forget who I am, my mental image, my mental energy, instead of being given over to the light, which is true understanding, which is an expression of myself, 
which cultivates love, which is a space of love and happiness and harmony so that you and I are grooving along and we're getting along together and all things are lifted to its highest place in that moment because in that moment I did not, I was not capable of standing in that place of love. Instead, the Course in Miracles says that your energy, energy has to go somewhere. It, it, it never nullified. So if your energy is not extending love, it is projecting fear. This is not where you're bad. It's where you're wounded. Now, the thing is, however, unless the person standing in front of you is an initiate, they don't see it as a place where you're wounded. Or at best, intellectually, they see it as a place where you're wounded. They just see it as a place where you're a jerk. And their ego, like your ego, avoids monitoring their own issues, but loves to monitor yours. <laughs> that is how the ego operates. The ego is vigil vigilant in recognizing and pointing out your character defects. Well, you know you have that issue. You realize that, right? Whereas that is not the kind of vigilance that God directs us to have. But we are to be vigilant in recognizing our own character defects, our own barriers to love. Now, as I said before, the healing, the Course in Miracles tells us, is not in the past, but in the present. If you were, and we all were to some extent, hurt in the past, the Course in Miracles says that God has the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs. It is therefore already programmed into the universe that the situations that would heal your past hurt are going to happen. But look at the way that this occurs. He says in The Course in Miracles, I cannot take from you what you will not give to me. So if I have a character defect, if I'm angry, if I'm manipulative, if I'm controlling, if I'm selfish, it would be a violation of my free will for the internal teacher, the Holy Spirit, whatever name you give it, to go deep into my subconscious mind and take this away from me. That would be a violation of my free will. The Course in Miracles says, once again, I cannot take from you what you will not release to me. The Course says you cannot bring the light to the dark. You must bring the darkness to the light. The Course in Miracles says it's not up to you what you learn. It is merely up to you whether you learn through joy or through pain. So it is not up to you whether or not you are going to be forced ultimately to recognize these aspects of yourself in order to give them over for surrender. The universe is intentional. It intends the enlightenment and the highest growth into perfect manifestation of joy and creativity of all living things. That means you and me. But we cannot grow into the highest version of ourselves without releasing that low version of ourselves, that fractal of energy, which is the false self made manifest through the, what is called the character defect. And so when we ask God to help us, the Course says, it is as though the Holy Spirit puts a magnifying glass right up to us. And that takes the form of situations in which your stuff becomes obvious. Now, the Course in Miracles says that these lessons come to us because the universe is merciful, because of God's love, infinite in all ways. These lessons come to us in ways where if we do not fight it, we can learn these lessons without pain. But if we continue to resist learning them because the universe is intentional, then situations will get more and more intense in which we will be forced to learn. Now, I already mentioned that the ego is so busy monitoring other people's issues, it doesn't want me to look at mine. And then the ego also would have you believe that basically you don't have any. <laughs> right? Because you were so busy monitoring other people's. And sometimes we don't want to look at our own character defects because we think, I will not be loved by people. If that's true about me, then why would anyone love me? The Course in Miracles talks about a circle of fear that we must go through 
in order to get to the light within us. And that circle of fear is this horror, this horror based on the interpretation of self that the world has given you. And that's that other people get it right, but you don't. That's that other people are beautiful, but you're not. Other people are brilliant, but you're not. And this is all a game, a charade that the ego plays with us. Rather than recognizing that this isn't just something that was thrust against you. If something's not working in your life, it's not because other people are lucky and you're not. It's not because other people get the breaks and you don't. It's because of something within you, the Course in Miracles says, that in that particular area is holding your good at bay. And sometimes we don't want to look because we think, well, if I look, it's something that I don't want to look at. But actually, when we do look at our issues, instead of bringing up this terrible self-hatred, the self-hatred is only when you don't quite look. You sort of look, you peek, but you go, oh, that's awful. And then you don't want to look anymore. But going through that circle, that, that circle of fear to the truth, then you realize how hurt you must have been in your life, in your childhood, and so forth to ever have come up with that coping mechanism or that false belief to begin with. If it was a core belief that you're not good enough or you don't get it or some pain, then that was some child who did the best they could to cope with that situation. That's the issue of the inner child. Now, when we remember, as The Course in Miracles says, that you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one. And that is your separation from God. Then you look at anything that's not working perfectly in your life and you go, well, my mind would tell me this is about work or my mind would tell me this is about love or my mind would tell me about this is about other people's issues or my mind would tell me about it's my issue but I have to figure out what happened in my childhood to create this issue and so forth. And then even if you think it's about your childhood, often we come to thinking, well, it was mommy's fault or daddy's fault. But you know, it really doesn't matter where you got it, it's yours now. And so the issue is for us to realize not how it got here, but that it is here. And once again, you cannot bring the light to the darkness, you have to bring the darkness to the light, which means, dear God, I recognize that I am this way. This in AA is the fearless moral inventory, the <clears throat> admitting of your character defects. Whether it's a core belief, you know, and then the ego comes up with ideas, well, isn't it that you think you don't deserve it? Or, and, you know, the ego has all kinds of ideas that seem to be taking responsibility, but aren't really seems to be recognizing where this comes from you, but it never has anything to do with your need to change your behavior. And when you do, when you move through that circle of fear, then as the Course in Miracles says, you, you think that if you look deeply at who you are, that everybody, anybody who saw this would recoil in horror if they saw how ugly you really are. But the truth of the matter is, if people saw who you really are, they would be amazed by the glorious gorgeousness of who you are. But they are not going to see the gloriousness and the gorgeousness of who you are until you are willing to look at the gloriousness and gorgeousness of who you are, which you will not be able to see should you not first look honestly at the mask you wear that covers it. And so as we do allow God to reparent us, as we do look at Buddha or, or look at Moses or, or look at Jesus or look at any of the images of the light that are presented to humanity in this kaleidoscope of, of religious, genuinely religious possibility, and when I talk about religious, I don't mean organized, institutionalized, dogmatic, doctrinal, anything. I mean that genuine psychic force of the hand of God upon us. And Jesus being crucified is such a powerful symbol of that character defect because it is the place where your character defect, which is the expression of the ego, that's what the crucifixion is. It is the attack on the Son of God. And the Son of God is not just one man 2,000 years ago. The Course in Miracles teaches us that the Son of God is each and every one of us. 
And the attack on the Son of God is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. The crucifixion of the Son of God was not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. The attack of the Son of God is something that happened to each and every one of us in this moment, and that attack is from your own mind, your own ego. Now, when Jesus was crucified, and he died, and he was placed in a cave, and three days later, women went to reclaim his body. And the angel who was standing at the entrance of the cave said, he is not here. He has risen. Now, this once again, if you look at the psychic reality of this, what does that mean? That means that through the power of God, as we surrender, as we give up our spirit, as we give up our soul, as we allow the cosmic reparenting to occur, we are lifted from that stuck psychological, emotional, and behavioral dynamic by which the character defect crucifies us. We are lifted above it through the realization that mommy and daddy and the childhood you lived on this earth was not the true story of your soul. Therefore, it's not what you need to identify with. You are a child of God, and there is nothing that the crucifixion can do, even unto death itself, that can change you and what you are. This is why in the fairy tales, when the wicked stepmother, i.e. your ego, always tries, she she gets a hunter, go kill her about Snow White, go kill her about Sleeping Beauty, but they never can. The best they can do is put her to sleep. She can be put to sleep. You can be put to sleep to the beauty in you. You can be put to sleep to the Christ in you. You can be put to sleep to the light within you, whatever name you call this. But it cannot be destroyed, and that is the message of the crucifixion. And to arise is to awaken. To see the light, the Course says, is to understand and this is the resurrection. Now, what does it mean when the angel said, he's not here, the dead body's not here? What that means is the you who had that behavioral characteristic that you call that character defect is gone. It goes beyond behavioral modification. Now, it takes that three days, which is also the symbolism of the 40 years in the Old Testament, between the condition of slavery, once again, same imagery, when the Israelites were enslaved by the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh being the ego, you're enslaved by it. You're enslaved by that part of you that blows it all the time. Enslaved by that character defect. Moses being the voice for God, leading us out of slavery, and that's what we're, everybody here, we're all in those three days, aren't we? We're all in those 40 years. My friend Sandy has a great expression, she calls it the tomb time. That time in which we're not yet quite on the cross, but we're not yet risen from it either. And when we truly are risen from it, then it's an issue you used to have. But somebody who meets you now doesn't even see it because you don't have it anymore. You have risen. And that's why we celebrate the resurrection. That's why it is something to be excited about, whether that particular story or some other particular story is the one that compels you. There are so many great spiritual tales, and the truth with a capital T is spoken in many different ways. It is spoken in secular ways. It is spoken in spiritual ways. A Course in Miracles itself, you know, it doesn't claim to be the the particular statement of these universal themes that is for everyone. It is based on these universal themes, And the issue is if you're looking for it, whatever book, whatever teaching that would get through to you temperamentally will find you the moment you make yourself available. And so tonight, our power lies in saying, this is what I do. I get it. I know it. I admit it. And asking God to take it from you. You know, that's the one thing that sometimes we just forgot to do. You know, sometimes people say, 
The language that you really hear that the ego loves is things like, I know I have to work on that. I, I'm working on that. I have to work on that. Or I, yeah, I'm trying to understand what that's about for me more. Those are all delay techniques. Those are all ways that the ego is seeking to avoid the decision. And we make that decision not in the moment when the character defect has us by the throat. Don't wait till that moment. Because by definition, in that moment of trigger, you are at, at the behest of the ego mind. At, at that moment, you have no power to rise above it. Rather, we dedicate each day. That's why the morning is so important. If I wake up in the morning thinking in terms of this neutrality myth, then I think, well, I can just go out into the day and basically just go out and try to get what I want, which means by definition, if my mind is filled with the thought, like I'm going to go out today and get what I want, you've already thrown yourself off your divine alignment. If you look at every day, wow, I wonder what's going to happen. You've already thrown yourself off your divine alignment. If you look at the day saying, oh, it's gonna, I know what it's going to be. It's so awful. I can't stand this. You've already thrown yourself off divine alignment. If you wake up in the, in the morning and you're indulging the thoughts that this person is awful and that person is awful and not forgiving this person and not forgiving that person, you've already thrown yourself off divine alignment. And your ego mind will take advantage of this. It is a place where you have not filled your house with light. The darkness will be there. The mental energy is going to go somewhere. And so that is why we make ourselves devotees. Out of self-interest. When you wake up in the morning and you say, where would you have me go, dear God? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? You're saying, put me on the right track. Because God knows things can get awful around here when I'm not. It's not that you're afraid of what might happen in the world. If anything we should be afraid of is what might happen in us. That you recognize that when left to my own devices, I have this aspect of myself that can get this way or can get that way. And that is why in The Course in Miracles it says, you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. So when you say, I don't know where I got angry, I don't know where I got manipulative, I don't know where I got selfish, I don't know where I got controlling, I don't know where I became a love addict, I don't know where I became a love avoidant, I don't know this, my mother, my father, all this stuff. Sometimes we are absolutely led to understand some of those things, and they can be helpful to the process. But they themselves are not the answer with a capital A, because the answer is God right now. And then what happens is that those places where we are broken become our sacred wounds. We realize that we are like the prodigal son. That the father was actually more happy to see the son who left and came back than to see the son who had never left. It's like when a bone is broken and it comes back together and it's even stronger in that place. And how does that show up in your personality? The way it shows up in your personality is that in the very place where you were most broken and you are no longer broken, there is a power in that place in your personality that seems to you almost greater than you would have had had you not first been broken there. And that is such a powerful demonstration of the mercy of the universe. And that very thing which had, when you were thinking about things or filtering them only through the mind of the ego, made you not want to look at it because you were afraid you'd be so horrified, or not looking at it because you were too busy at looking at other people's issues, and you open your heart and you say, I get that I do this. And I get that as long as I do this, love will not be able to find me. It's not that I will not be able to find love. Love is right here. It's that I'm hiding from love. And dear God, Please take this from me. Now, that does not mean that your temptation to go into that place will never happen again. It means it will happen fairly quickly. But you will no longer be anesthetized. You will no longer be blind to your own issues. And so next time that 
trigger occurs. Next time that thing happens, what makes you go into that place, makes you tend to get manipulative or selfish or needy or smothering or controlling, I'm not even saying that next time that happens, man, you just won't go there. You might go there. But this time you will go there conscious that you're going there. It's like you will be looking down on yourself, going, oh my God. And you will see yourself in that moment as other people see you. And you will hear yourself in that moment as other people hear you. And depending on the situation, they might not even want to hear it if you say, oh, I'm really sorry for having done that. Because they might have seen it or heard it enough. Are you with me? But you will never be unconscious to it again. And the ego would have you just go back to sleep and not see it. This is why you don't want to avoid the pain of personal growth. Because it's in those moments of, of horror. <gasps> I'm really that way? Sometimes that's exactly where you need to go. Exactly the moment you need to burn through. So then that first time it happens, it does come up, that magnifying glass, that thing that triggers you, because once again it has to come up in order to be healed as kind of an emotional detox. And you'll see yourself doing it. You'll, you'll recognize yourself doing it. And it just might be that this thing is so deep and the subconscious musculature and the emotional sp muscle spasm is so great that you watch yourself, but you still do it. But you get that you're starting to see. And then slowly but surely, it will occur. And then maybe the next time, <coughs> what will happen is that you get that you're about to do it. You don't know how to do it right. You don't really know how not to be manipulative. You don't know how to not be selfish. You don't even know how, what it would look like to get it right. But you're ready to at least fake it. You know, they say in A, it's easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than to think yourself into a new way of acting. You, you are ready to at least behaviorally modify. And one of the things I've seen in my life that has constantly amazed me is if, and it makes sense because the universe is here at your service. So if I have something in my life or my personality, I go, I just don't know how to do that right. But I'm willing to. I know the way I do it is wrong. I just don't know how to do it right. You will find yourself, you'll just happen to be in a situation where someone who did not have that particular childhood wound happens to be demonstrating, and they have no idea that they're demonstrating it for your sake, but they will demonstrate to you what someone looks like and how someone acts who did not have that wound, who, who does not have that particular issue. And that is part of your healing because you do start emulating, you do start imitating it. How do people who get this right act? How do people who get this right talk? How do people who get this right behave? And slowly but surely, you begin to wear the coat of your true self. You know, when you've been crouching, when you've been cowering in this place of false self that has taken such form within your personality that the ego has succeeded in convincing you, well, that's just how I am, then the true mantle of Christ, the light, the whatever image you use, wouldn't even feel natural to you. Even if you knew what it looked like, you, you, it, would be, it would feel fake because the Course in Miracles says that at a certain point in our lives, that was as natural feels unnatural, and that which is unnatural feels natural. So it's like you don't even know how to look and be and act wise. You don't even know how to look and be and act serene. You don't even know how to look and be and act unneedy, unmanipulative, uncontrolling, and so forth. But when we wake up every morning and make this our dedication, knowing that the world will be a better place if you're a better man. The world will be a better place if you're a better woman because every moment that we do not show up as our best, then a possibility for great things is deflected. Not just for you, but for other people too. Because when you show up in your light, you attract other people in their light to collaborate with you for the extension of further light. And that's okay, because even when we show up in our weakness and we attract other people in their weakness, that too will provide the other, both people to grow out of it. But the ego in them will conspire with the ego in you to use this as a place where we can both hide from our weakness. And often, we call that love. If instead we say, I, I want to be strong, and there's a gospel song that I really love where they go, I, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. 
There are exercises in the Course in Miracles where you declare, you know, we affirm. I affirm that I have that apartment, or I affirm that I have that money, I affirm that I have that relationship, whatever it is. It's rather, I affirm that I am the person I'm capable of being. Because that's what the Christ, the Buddha, the Shekinah, that's what it all is. And that's why we worship. You worship God because that which you worship, you become. So you can't get rid of darkness by, turning on the, uh, by bat, battling it with a baseball bat. You get rid of the darkness by turning on the light. And you can't get rid of the ego by fighting it. It isn't anything. It's simply a hallucinatory fractal of energy that is posing as you. It's a mask we wear. It's a masquerade, but that masquerade has become an emotional or psychological habit. So tonight, let's take this opportunity to go into that sacred temple place. And like I said early in the evening, you know what it is you do. You know, this is not new to you. It's just that it kind of hangs out there. And sometimes the older you get, the more you're tempted to think, well, this is just the way I am. And we try to get other people to accommodate to the way we are. I, I know that I'm asking you to call me a lot, but I told you when I met you that I have abandonment issues. <laughs> right? And strong people will tell you they're very sorry about that, but you really should think about getting over that because they're not hanging for it. And so we want to be our best, we want to be strong, because we want to play in these fields with people who are also strong and people who are also at their best. Now, when we begin to realize and to recognize that our character defects are not where we're bad, but where we're wounded, one of the blessings of this, I think when you feel that God has been merciful towards you, it helps us to be more merciful towards others. When you feel, I had this issue, or I had that issue, and then you feel that you've been healed in some way, then when you see other people who have issues, you're more likely to have compassion for them. And to know, as the Course in Miracles says, that that which is not love is a call for love. The real light within them is saying, I'm here. I know I'm not showing myself to you right now, but I'm really here. Because that's what happens when we're nuts and we're crazy and we're whatever it is we do as character defects. The real us is there. It's trapped. It's in that cave. It's on that cross. And so the Course in Miracles is asking us, says to identify those things and give them to God and ask that he take them away. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to wake up in the morning and you're never going to do that again. But it will open up your mind, number one, to realize it when you're doing it. Number two, to have more, not only self-awareness, but self-control and impulse control. That the fact that you know is not enough. But the fact that even though you, you are not healed, when it comes up, you can make a choice. You are a master. You are a cause rather than an effect. And you can say, even though I feel like saying that, I'm not going to. Even though I feel like indulging myself and sending this ridiculous text, I'm not going to. Even though I feel like indulging myself and doing something really manipulative right now, I'm not going to. And then you're going to be alert to all the ways that God sends you, not only books and teachers, but these passion plays of seeing people who, wow, that's how someone acts who's not hurt that way. Wow, I, and often it's like, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could just let people be free. I didn't know you could do this or that. And you realize that the whole universe is, the only reason it exists is to give you this gift. And ultimately you will begin to heal. And the fact that you went through that crucifixion of your own and that healing of your own will make you far more compassionate, merciful towards other people who are on their own crosses. And I'm not saying that, I mean, I suppose at a level of complete enlightened master, you, people have grown past them all. I'm not at that place, so I don't know, but I, because I know of a life in which you kind of put down that cross and, you know, there'll be the next thing and there'll be the next thing. 
but it's all building towards something. And I think that what's so beautiful about meeting other people who are also on this path, you know, we're all on a spiritual path, most people just don't know it. But the more we find ourselves in actual molecular contact with other people who are consciously seeking to stand in their strength, not indulging our weakness, not indulging thoughts that this is the way I am or just have to figure it out or I'm working on it, but knowing that the fate of humanity as we know it has to do with whether or not we become the people we need to be to transform the conditions of the earth. We are all literally here to be saviors. You know, we talk about how Jesus' crucifixion is, is, is not just about one man. Jesus' resurrection is not just about one man. And Jesus as Savior is not just about one man. The Course in Miracles says we are all here to be saviors to the world. Because when we are saved, all that it means to be saved is to be saved from our own insane thinking. And that's all that a character defect is, where we're at the effect of insane thinking. And to whatever extent we are saved from that, then in that place that we stand within ourselves where we are no longer crazy, then other people who are in our presence, they can't be crazy in that place either. Because the light in you touches the light within them, which means not only were you saved, but you save. That's the big story. That's what's really going on in your life. The Course in Miracles says you can treat these ideas as, as toys, and they'll have the effect of toys in your life. You can treat these ideas as metaphors, and they'll have the uh, effect of metaphors in your life. You can treat them as symbols, and they'll have the effect of symbols in your life. But if you see these psychic realities, which are the true religious realities, spiritual realities, as the forces and the dynamics which run the universe, then so they will be for you. And so, let's close our eyes now. And let's get comfortable in our seat. And let's just feel the relief of knowing that there's no point in running away any longer. We are so tired of running away, <coughs> of pretending that it's not true, of thinking that it's other people's issues. And in this moment, we allow ourselves to look at those barriers, those character defects, those things we do or do not do the energy we put out or the energy we do not put out, where we do too much or do too little, knowing that everything that happens in our lives is a reflection of our own, our own thoughts and our own feelings. Right now, we give to God those things that we know are our sacred wounds. The place where the ego mind time and time again tempts us into fear, into craziness, into playing it small, into being grandiose, into being selfish, into being controlling, into being angry, into being harsh, into being judgmental. into whatever form of weakness it uses to hold us hostage, to make us suffer, to deflect the miracles, to turn away from love, to make us suffer, and to deny us the experience of happiness and inner peace. We now pray to whatever form, whatever savior, whatever teacher, whatever image of God is true for us. I hand this to you, please take it away. 
I give to you those thoughts I think. I give to you those things I do. I give to you that place I go in my mind and my personality. I give to you that way I have of being. I give to you that mental habit. I give to you that emotional craziness. Where I play it too small or I play it too big. Where I'm just a little off. I give to you my addictions and I give to you my wounds. I give to you my dysfunctional relationships with food, with drugs, with alcohol, with people, with things, with my body. Whatever it is. Without shame, without horror, but simply with brutal honesty. Knowing that God already knows these things. He loves us for he knows who we truly are. He would have us love ourselves as he loves us. To see through these illusions of who we are to the truth. And so on this holy night we give to God that which is not love within us. That we might emerge from the cave. That the deadened places within us shall now resurrect that the way we could have been but did not know how to be, the way we could have been that we were born to be, but that which got suppressed so many years ago, we've lost contact with even how to do it, that that might once again spring to new life. This new day, this resurrection of the true immortal self. May this miracle occur within us. As each of us in our own way give to God what we do not want knowing he was simply waiting for us to ask him to take it. Knowing that he answers every invitation the moment we make it. We invite him now to enter our mind, to enter our psyche, to enter our deepest thoughts and emotions, to unwire those crossed places within us. That where we were weak, we shall now be strong. Where we were bound in fear, we shall now be freed to love. Where we dwelled in darkness, we shall now dwell in light. We feel his hand upon us. We feel his spirit moving within us. We understand what it means to say hallelujah. But we know we shall be set free. We dedicate all that we have and all that we are to God to use for his purposes. Asking that we be lifted to the truth of who we are not only for the sake of our own peace and happiness, but for the sake of all the world. And so it is. We all say, Richard Lerma. I was at an event uh, not too long ago. Um, it was M Muslims for Progressive Values, I think it's called. 
And I heard a young man do a spoken poem performance. Uh, I thought he was just great. And I asked him if he'd like to come here and perform this for us. Tom Earl, how are you? Good to see you. Um, he's here to perform it. It's called The Middle Path. You can go to tomearl.com for more information. I think that you will feel as I do that there's something very powerful about what he shares. Tom Earl. soul. There are days where I wear my religion like a complex shirt. It covers and protects me, but there are these dangling loose strings of doubt and worry, and I worry that if I pull them, the whole thing will begin to unravel, and I will once again be left standing naked and alone in this world serve cold. I unfold my clenched fist. And like droplets of ink splashed into water, I watch as my fingers spread out from one another, five of them. Just like my extremities, like my senses, like my toes, like my pillars, like my prayers, I swear there's something mystical to this number, but who knows? Could all be a ridiculous coincidence, or maybe, maybe this is an incident of whispers from the divine. But I do know that there's always room inside our bodies for more negativity. And in the past, I have been guilty of being one who would fill every space I could find with poison and self-hate. I began to escape the day that I believed in something greater than myself, that something greater than myself was service to community and a vision of a world where everyone is treated with respect and dignity. Two years later, I converted to Islam. Two things Islam has taught me was how to deal with grief and how to persevere. For we are a religion of hope. But I also know that there are wolves who will steal happiness while wearing a smile. Because many men would rather suck bile through a straw than have to chew on an original thought for themselves. They are the ones who seal the coffins of transformative dialogue and introspection with their false allegations of haram and innovation. And I have 1,023 middle fingers for all of these supposed religious leaders who are really nothing more than bullies, pushing people out rather than welcoming them in. We must admit there is an exodus of people from our spiritual spaces. And that's the problem because you see, spirituality is not just about salvation. It's also about community. Ya Allah, please forgive me. This is my story. I took a journey through the desert and ran dry of water. So I went within and found nourishment in my relationship with God. We communed, and I arrived at a destination of humbleness and gratitude. I cried, and my tears, they gave life to an internal garden of courage and acceptance of the fact that my relationship with God is not determined by the circumference of man's control of earth, but rather it radiates from the radius of God, master of this entire universe. I now know this, that my frustrations... They arise when I start to pay mind to ritual rather than prayer. When I focus on the rules of man rather than divine. But alhamdulillah, with difficulty comes ease and sometimes God tests us just to hear us cry out his name, which is why it's possible that through my pain I found peace. Spirituality is not a selfish practice because it's also about love, acceptance, and understanding. And we can only find those things when we begin to see them in and share them with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tom Earl. Thank you, Tom. It was uh, wonderful to hear the second time as it was wonderful to hear the first. What I'm going to do is go down and let's talk to people here tonight. Who's first? Okay, over there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, somebody over there? Okay, hi. Hi. So first off, I'm really nervous. There's a lot of people here. So can we talk about dating? What did you say? Talk about dating. Dating, okay. So I've been dating this guy for about three months. 
And about a month ago, we went on a ski trip, had a great time. And I was going to ask him, you know, maybe if he wanted to be exclusive, but he was really clear that he didn't want to have a boyfriend. He got out of he, was, he got were, out of a relationship in November. Uh huh. <clears throat> so the circumstances are we see each other like once a week and we're dating. But I have a lot of like insecurities about what he does on his other times. Right. So I want to know how do I just accept like this relationship as it is. I really enjoy it. I have fun hanging out with him, but I'm like maybe insecure. Would you say at this moment that it's really being honest with yourself to say that you're enjoying this? What's that? Is it really, are you really being honest with yourself at this point to say that you're enjoying it or are you not enjoying it one night of the week and suffering for the other six days? That's probably more accurate. Well, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, so I'm asking honestly. I thought about that, but I, I do enjoy <clears throat> our time together. Mm -hmm. You know, and versus not having that, I enjoy. I understand. You know, one of the things I remember Pat Allen saying, I heard her say this many years ago, um, and she said men, uh, the, she was talking about men and women, and she was saying, men don't lie unless a woman has proven to them that they have to in this situation or she'll get hysterical. And she was talking about how in many situations the problem is not that he didn't tell you, it's that you didn't believe him or you didn't listen to him. Or you thought, he'll change, because once he's with me, he's not going to turn away from this. It's too good. Yes, he will, actually. <laughs> right? So the issue for you is that he told you. Right. Now, this brings up, and, and you're a man too, so some of the psychological stuff might be different. I know for a woman, a woman's, uh, once, you know, literally a man enters any orifice, it could be her ear and she's hooked in terms of chemicals, right? I'm there. Right, right? So, so it, it could be argued, and you, this is only a decision you can make for yourself because there's no right or wrong. But there is something here about honoring ourselves. Once you have sexual relationship with somebody and they have told you, I'm, I don't want a relationship, they probably mean it, and so now you have to ask yourself. Um, this is a question that cannot be answered by anyone but you. But it doesn't sound to me, and I'm only getting my information from you, it doesn't sound like he's changing his mind. Correct. When you have these psychic images of what he's doing when he's not with you, you're probably right. That's right. And then the issue is for you to put that in God's hands. Now, as you do that, you might find that you um, become someone for whom that's okay. You know, maybe for you that's genuinely okay. And maybe it's not. But that's what you have to go deep within yourself and ask for. And also, and once again, these, I'm, I'm asking questions. Only you can discern the answer. You are allowing all that psychic energy of what you do not want to be in your space. What, do you mean? what does that mean? What, what it means is, you know, it's like I always say, if, if the train doesn't stop at your station, it's not your train. But even more than that, the train that could get in. Sure. You know, because this train is being held there. So sometimes it's like you say to the universe, why do you only bring me this? And the universe is saying, well, I saw no indication that you mind it. Right? Like there was that song by George Michael many years ago, that great where he says, I gotta have faith. That great song, the lyrics of that song are so powerful because sometimes the universe has to hear you say no to what you don't want. So once again, those are the questions. The answer only you, you can ask. But it's not that he's giving you too little, it's not about him, he's been honest. But you have to ask yourself, because what you really want is someone that you have that same kind of relationship with who wants to be there seven nights a week, or close enough to seven nights a week that they're not playing with somebody else on the other nights. And, that, and so there's something about honoring that. And then when you allow yourself to, to ask that deeper question, from that deeper question, you know, a lot of times the reason we don't have the answers is because we're not yet asking the deeper questions. Okay. 
So now, having said that, I also want to say, and we say it all the time, when you are in a room like this, it's when you have prayed with other people, it's very difficult to lie to yourself. So really take yourself very seriously when you're in a room like this. So, and you don't have to tell us, but it, whatever your heart's saying right now, take it very seriously. All right, thank you. That, does that? Yeah, it does. <laughs> that lady over there. Uh, we can do that, but this lady right here I met, and then we'll go to whomever. Yes, hi. <laughs> hi. This topic was so perfect for me tonight. Um, my boyfriend's father passed away on Friday. And, you know, he's been there, and I've been here, and he's coming back tomorrow. And I just don't know, like, how he's going to, like, in what way he'll need me, you know? If, and I know that if he wants a lot of love and attention and me to really be there, like, I'm going to be good at that because giving love in that way makes me feel good, is what really it comes down to, I've been realizing at the end of the day. But if he needs space just to just have his process, that's going to be very hard for me. I know that. Because I, like you've been saying, I'm aware of myself now. But it's, I guess I'm just asking, like, in the moment when I want to react to him needing space, or I have an issue with that, or I'm not feeling good about that, like, in the moment when I'm like, okay, I'm doing it. Like, how do I stop it? You know, it's like... Well, there are two issues here. First of all, there is an issue about loving people in a way that feels like love to them. Yeah. Like, I remember reading that book, Love Languages. It's really interesting, you know, because what might feel good to me might not be what feels good to you. So, finding out what would feel good to him overrides ultimately your kind of just compulsive need to express your energy in a way that might seem like love to you but actually you know is not for him. Have you asked him how you could best be here for him right now? I'm going to ask him when he gets back tomorrow. I've tried to just give him his space while he's with his family. And Are you sure that's what he wants? The funeral. I think so, because I've reached out to him, and he's not super responsive. So okay. I'll just kind of say, like, I love you, call me when you can. But it's not very often. So I think while he's been there, he's definitely wanted space. But when he gets back, I'm not sure. So I, I think there is him. something about asking him. Yeah. But I think for your own part right now, it's about your... Remember when we were talking tonight about when you go to the light, the darkness disappears. When you're dedication, I want to be a space, if, if you can't be, if, if this is a love partner for you and you can't show up to be there for them in the way they would wish when their parent has died, right? So you say, dear God, you want to be a space for possibility, a possibility for the person that you love. You want to be a space where, and you want them to be this to you too, don't get me wrong, but you want to be a space where they are healed, where not only they feel loved, but they feel your love in a way that feels right to them. If that is your dedication, if that is your devotion, if that is your prayer, and that is your prayer. And sometimes, not just certain people, but all of us at certain times, sometimes we want, be right here, sometimes give me space, yeah. right? We all go through those things. So if you say, dear God, show me not only how to love him now, but pray for him, pray for his family, pray for his father. You know, you just keep your, make yourself very much in service to this healing. And spirit will direct you. You will be guided. You know, the voice for God, the whole point of meditation, the whole point of prayer, the whole, whole point, of Course in Miracles students, of doing the workbook exercises and so forth, is so that we become, as the Course in Miracles says, in touch moment by moment with the voice for God. And he will feel that from you. Because otherwise what he will feel, even if you're acting in a way that's giving him a lot of attention, he will feel like it's more about you than about him. Because people who are all over us, when we don't feel like we want them there, it doesn't feel like love to us. It feels like their emotional neediness played out in a way that they say it's because they love us. But really, if they loved us, they'd back off. 
And I, I, yeah, I don't want to be like that. I really do want to be in service. Once so again, so just, once again, you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. That's why we talk here about the mystical third. You know, make God your primary relationship. When you are healed in your relationship with God, you are more likely to be healed in your relationship with other people. When you are fractured in your relationship with God, you're more likely to experience fractures in your relationships with other people. Don't make your relationships with other people separate from your relationship with God. And you dedicate that relationship to God. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank okay, you so great. much. Thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Somebody, oh, yes ma'am. So, um, I've been praying a lot about my mom and I. Um, for many years, I've, every six months or so, it's like, please help me, God, be better to my mom. Um, she's manipulated me a lot over the years, and the struggle comes up often, and we work together, and I want to kill her at times. And my husband just told me the other day that the struggle happens every six months or so, and I want, I want peace. And tonight was so perfect, and I feel like you've helped me so much. And I'm sure a lot of us struggle with our parents and want to break down those walls and have that peace. What is your name? Cynthia. What is your mother's name? Sherry. Charity? Sherry. I'm sure Cynthia is not the only person here who would like a healing with someone. And in your relationship with your boyfriend, it's the same. But let's pray with Cynthia and with Charity uh, for, for her relationship with Charity and Sherry. for all of us, if you Sherry. want. Sherry. I'm sorry? Sherry. Cherry? Sherry. Cynthia and Sherry. Yes. Okay. Cynthia and Sherry. So uh, as a name comes up for you or some relationship that you're in that you'd like healed, we can we can all use this prayer for ourselves as well. Dear God, we join with Cynthia as she places in your hands her relationship with her mother, Sherry. And as she does this, dear God, we too place in your hands our relationship with whatever person or people have occurred to us in this moment. We pray that these relationships between Sharon and Sherry, Cynthia and Sherry, but also our own relationships now be lifted up above and beyond all conflict, all walls, and all separation from the past. May Cynthia and Sherry and all of us now be lifted to divine right order as a great wave of forgiveness comes upon them. May they and we see only now the innocence in ourselves and in each other. May all focus on the other's guilt be removed from our minds. May all focus on past mistakes be removed from our minds. May all grievance now be removed from our minds. Rather, dear God, in this moment, may these relationships be reborn. For we can have a grievance or a miracle, we cannot have both. May we now see this other person as you would have us see them, as the innocent child of God that they are. And may they see us as you see us. And thus may all darkness be removed, all shadows be removed, that the light in them might extend into the light that is us, and the light that is us might extend into the light that is them, that there shall be no more separation, and thus no more tears. We pray for this, for Cynthia and for Sherry, and for us all. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. <clears throat> A Course in Miracles talks about relationships and it says that a relationship is reborn in any moment when we do not bring the past with us. And as I mentioned in the prayer, the Course in Miracles says you can have a grievance or you can have a miracle, but you cannot have both. I can either be focused on your mistake or I can extend my perception 
beyond the bodily level to that place where you are pure, innocent spirit. If I choose to limit my perception to the level of your body and thus the level of your mistakes, then I will be dooming myself to an experience of my own limitations. But if I'm willing to extend my perception into the realm of knowledge of the truth of who you are, this is an act of generosity that the Course in Miracles says is actually an act of self-interest. Because only if I'm willing to experience your innocence am I willing to experience my own. Only if I am willing, and this goes back to each of us are saviors, only if I'm willing to see you beyond the mistakes you have made before this moment will I be willing to see myself beyond the mistakes I made before this moment. And with parents and children, man, that can be tough, right? But that's also why they are what The Course in Miracles calls lifetime assignments, obviously. <laughs> right? Okay. Yes, down there, that lady there. And then I'll come to you, okay? Hi, honey. Hi, yes, ma'am. You can stand up. That would be good because then they would see you and that's good. Hi. Hi, I'm Joyce from Michigan. Hi, Joyce from Michigan. Are you from Michigan and I knew you before? Weren't you in Detroit? Oh, I sure yeah. was, yeah. <laughs> I sure was. Um, my question is, or comment, I don't know which it is, but mm -hmm. um, it seems that we, as we have come out of the Piscean Age, we have grown into a much deeper community of spirituality within within the world. And yet, as I look at the political climate and um, candidates that are running for president, um, it feels like we're almost going backward because the ego is so strong and fear-based. And I'm wondering how, as a spiritual community, we can combat that so that we have government officials that look at how we can be better communities, better worlds together, serving each other for the better good. You know, first of all, you said you thought that the world had advanced in our capacity to be a community. It could be argued that we have regressed as a civilization because industrialization has made it easier for us to be siloed. You know, there are cultures um, in which no one can indulge the belief that they don't need everybody else in the village. And so modern society, post-industrial society and so forth, has actually increased the sense of isolation by increasing the sense that I don't need you. So first of all, I'm not so sure that, that this idea, that I think the idea of community is very in vogue. But I think one of the reasons the idea of community isn't very in vogue is because there's so little community. We're just talking about it so much because we need it. There was, uh, many of our ancestors didn't talk about it. It was what they lived because nobody thought that they could survive without it. Does that make sense? I think now we definitely have an understanding. I do think what there is is a mass understanding that we don't have enough of it, that we are isolated, that we are lonely, that we have taken this notion of rugged individualism too far. Um, to the point where we have failed to recognize on a cultural basis, on a, um, on a spiritual basis, on an emotional basis, and on a political basis that it can't just be about me, it's got to be about us. Now, the thing about American democracy that makes it such a space of incredible possibility is that theoretically, we can create whatever kind of society we want. And I do believe that there are many people, in fact, when I was saying before about all these people I've met who are running for Congress that are so great, it, it, it's, it's very painful, it's very poignant because I meet these people, as you'll see them interviewed, they're, they're, we've already got nine interviews up there on sistergiant.com, they're such cool people. And you think, wow, if Congress was made up of these kind of people, 
These people represent the better angels of our nature. What has happened, however, is because of the undue influence of money on our politics, um, democracy itself is stymied. And we have this kind of corporate totalitarianism that I was talking about earlier, where the heart and humanitarian values does not seem to have the upper hand. The idea of short-term economic gain for particular forces. So if they want a war, there's a war. If they want GMOs, there are GMOs. If they want fracking, there's fracking. Uh, if, if they want to deregulate to the point of complete irresponsibility towards the earth and the children of the earth, then they do. And right now, it has reached such a perilous point that the people of our country are deciding for ourselves what we are going to do about that. Now, this is the problem. Because of the undue influence of money, they are in charge of politicians. Because of the undue influence of money, they are in charge of the leadership and establishment of both major political parties. And because of corporate ownership of the media, they are in charge of the media. And they have proven over the last few months they will allow no one who resists the corporatocracy to get anywhere near the levels of power. And this is a very dark time because of it. And Flint, Michigan, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So the problem is not just Flint, Michigan. The problem is the system that gives rise to this. And that's why just giving money to Flint, Michigan, as important as that is, we must address the systemic problem. I think sometimes in life, I think part of growing up, and I think this is true of a nation growing up, you know, the thing here is that just as we have an individual ego, Collectives have egos. National psyches have egos. And aristocracy, we repudiated it in the founding of this country. And it's back because this is more, this is an aristocratic situation we're talking about. And the question remains whether, now there's one major candidate who is the aristocracy, and there's another major candidate who says, we can compromise, we can work with them. But as Frederick Douglass says, you know, power never you know, that we will never cede power, it must be demanded. And right now, we've been, we've been lulled to sleep in this country. Um, and the problem here is that we don't have that much longer. And that's what growing up does. You know, when you're young, ah, it'll be another love affair, it'll be another marriage, it'll be another baby, it'll be another whatever. And you grow up and you go, this is, you know, life is not, and you're nodding. We, this is what growing up is. And I think in the United States, with these extraordinary freedoms and the extraordinary powers of democracy, we've taken it for granted. This is not guaranteed. This is not guaranteed. And we have a situation now where this kind of corporate totalitarianism, it's almost locked. It's almost a lock right now, and you can see it, the way Bernie Sanders is so trivialized and marginalized. That's, they don't, this is like 1968, but they don't kill you anymore. They just marginalize you, and they demoralize those who support you. It is, for those of us who are old enough to remember, this is, and I think that, you know, it's a beautiful thing about age and young. The younger you are, the more you know about what's going on now, and the older you are, the more you know about things that do not change. And I think those of us who remember the 60s and all of that have a lot to give right now because, we, you know, the older you are, the more the keeper of the story that you are. And we saw something shut down. But this time, the capacity to shut down, even though they don't physically assassinate anymore, or they would obviously prefer not to, the shutting down, it, 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 it's, there's almost something worse going on. So I hope that, that, you know, once again, the Course in Miracles, this is not about my having answers or anything like that. This is about all of us, though, starting to ask deeper questions. And as a generation, we have been so seduced by the bombardment of ultimate meaninglessness that passes for popular culture that it is sucking our life force. And we are not showing enough righteous indignation. And we're not even putting up a fight. And from a spiritual perspective, it's not about a fight, but it is about using the powers that we are given. So somebody said to me on a, on a 
Twitter the other day, oh, Marian, there's no revolution. And my response to that, well, if there's not, that's very sad, because there should be. There should be a political revolution in this country. And John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. You know, Martin Luther King talked about two kinds of peace, negative peace and positive peace. He said negative peace is where there's no outright conflict or violence. That's, but there's an underlying tension and anxiety. And that's what's happening now, whether it's Occupy or the Sanders campaign or something, you feel it coming up from the bottom of this thing. This will blow. This is going to blow. There's too much suffering. There's too much hardship. You cannot do what we're doing now without it blowing at some point. Because when you're hoarding so much wealth and so much opportunity and so much education and so much health into the hands of the very, very few, it's like in the body. If you took all the blood and put it in one hand, it's not healthy. And the fact that you can make it in America is such a beautiful thing. But America is supposed to be a place where, to the best of our ability, we create a situation where everybody works hard enough can have a chance to. And so these are all things that I, I don't need to tell you any more about because you know what they are. Um, if you ask me what can I do, I'll tell you, because for myself, one of the things is, uh, you know, we, we, we focus on the presidential election. You can see what's already happening in the presidential election. But, in, but Congress is a co-equal branch of government. So I hope you will look at Sister Giant. I hope you will look at those interviews. I hope you will look on the page where you can contribute to the PAC to support. Because these are candidates, all of them, who in their primaries are running against representatives of the established order. And you know, when I ran for Congress, people all over this country were so generous to me. And even though I don't feel the call to run, these people are great, but they don't have platforms because they wrote books or whatever. But, you know, it, it, it's an honor to, to introduce you to them and hope that we will support, support them because what it has shown me, you know, I, we are good people. You know, people are good. It's not just Americans are good as opposed to anyone else. You know, I was asked by a congressman at this retreat I did recently, he said, well, how can we get people to care about Flint? I said, excuse me, the people of America care about Flint. It was the government of Michigan who, do this, who did this. It wasn't the people, right. right? By the way, when's your governor going to jail? I hope soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me take that back. I need to be more careful. When is he going to be held accountable? got to be careful. Yeah, honey. Something I think interesting happened today. Yeah, what happened today? Uh, I know you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, um, but did you hear Hillary's speech today? Um, no, I heard her the other night. Was she, she wonderful? She gave a speech today <clears throat> about uh, love and yeah. how we need to move to be a love-centered society. I thought mm -hmm. it was quite remarkable. I think she's a lovely person. I think Hillary Clinton is a lovely person, and I, I can't say she's a friend, but she's an acquaintance. When she was in the White House, she was very kind to me, actually. I spent the night there, I had a weekend at Camp David. I, she's a lovely person. This is not about that. She might have given a lovely speech about love, and I'm not saying it was all an act, but I am saying this. She's a militarist, she supports GMOs, she does not support the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, she does not think that the big banks should be broken up, she thinks the only thing wrong with GMOs is that the biochemical companies uh, need better PR. And so this is not about whether or not she's a lovely person. I think she is a lovely person. We're talking about political issues, and I simply do not agree with her politically. And I hope that we do not get seduced by the fact that she gave a speech about love. Right? And, you know, I'm sure she doesn't think I should be president either. We don't owe it to each other, you know. So that's great. I think uh, that the issue is uh, if she becomes president and if she wins the nomination, I will certainly vote for her. But in, not everybody agrees with it, but I will. <clears throat> the issue is that all of us will need to remind her of that speech. <laughs> I 
Francis, you know, we all have our opinions, and, and that's cool. You know, it's a democracy. Bernie Sanders, LA event, Burning Man bus, B-E-R-N-I-N-G. If you feel the burn, help fuel the burn. The Burning Man bus, uh, March the 12th, 7 to 10, at the whole nine gallery in Culver City. Yeah. And everybody now has to just ask in yourselves, uh, your own heart. You know, my watch is uh, uh, crazy. 9.12, okay, just a little bit more. Okay, yes ma'am, I had said I'd come to you. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, I know in your book you mentioned in your mid-20s or early 20s being kind of confused before you return, found In your Return to Love? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I was quite I've, confused. That's putting it nicely. Yeah, um, I feel very much I can relate to that and I was just wondering how you had the strength to... Um, follow through with an unconventional path because I feel very drawn to spirituality and art and I'm working in a place where I it's great and I appreciate having a job um, but I feel constant pressure that like the things I'm interested in aren't necessarily a real job and just how did you have the strength to follow through on that? If that makes I'm not sense. sure I understand because from a Course in Miracles perspective what we do on the outside is not the issue. There are people who are dedicated servants of God, students of Course in Miracles, whatever, who have very traditional paths. And there are people who are very devoted to love who have non-traditional paths. The path on the outside is not what matters. The path on the inside is what matters. Does that make sense? And as you make, once again, you make your relationship with God first. Are you doing the Course in Miracles yet? Um, no, I'm not doing okay, it. Okay, so, but you must have read A Return to Love because that's where you're basing your story. Yes. So if you are attracted to the ideas in A, cor in a Return to Love, mm -hmm. Return to Love is like the cliff notes of A Course in Miracles, right? right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who have very traditional jobs because that's where they are assigned. That's their dharma. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have very non-traditional jobs. It, that, the externals are not what matters. Mm -hmm. Every, it, you know, the, we can't see anything from that. It's about, on the inside, are, are we seeking no matter where, whether you go into a bank or into a corporate office or you go into an art studio, mm -hmm. are you looking at the person in front of you and saying in your heart, silently, the love in me salutes the love in you? The light in me salutes the light in you. To God, you know, even when we were talking about corporate fascism or corporate totalitarianism, that's talking about systems. It's not talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. So somebody working in a corporate office is an innocent child of God. We're, we're not, you know, even on that, we're not talking about demonizing individuals. Mm -hmm. So when you, you could be walking into a bank or you could be walking into a, a, a food kitchen and from A Course in Miracles perspective, the person in front of you is an innocent child of God who was sent to you in this moment so that you could bless them and be more blessed. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's yeah. what The Course in Miracles. So you, this whole thing with how do you have strength to, to go out or anything like that, becomes, that's not where your mind goes. Because what happens is the universe is programmed for perfection. The embryo is programmed to become the baby. The acorn is programmed to become the oak tree. The bud is programmed to become the blossom. And you, like everything else in the universe, are programmed to be the highest manifestation of your possible self on earth this lifetime. That is already programmed. Now, that might on the outside take a very traditional form or non-traditional form. We can't know. I can't know and you can't know. And I'm not sure those things even mean anything anymore anyway, right? I mean, what does that even mean, particularly in California, right? So, uh, but the issue is that as you align yourself through prayer, through meditation, through practicing the principles, through seeking to make your life about forgiveness on any given day, as you do that, you will meet the people and find yourself in the situations which guide you to that highest manifestation. And if God says, work in that office, work in that office. If God says, work in that less traditional place, work in that less traditional place. Because you can't know. As a matter of fact, 
If you have some kind of judgment on a more traditional place, you, spirit might assign you to that more traditional place because spirit might want you to know those ordinances and children of God no different than any place else. Mm. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't have time to take all these. I, I know, so I don't know. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, it's, oh, you look so, like you want it so bad. Okay, so you go very, very quickly, and I'm going to go very, very quickly. So only keep your hand up if you really feel it's important. Go quickly, and I'm going to go quickly. That's yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so my question is, we've been on this spiritual journey, like, sincerely for about three years, and reading your book, Return to Love, was absolutely amazing. And... Because I am such an obsessive personality, I find myself almost creating situations, thinking that perhaps if I were to explore it infinitely, I might get the lesson from life that I'm supposed to be deriving from whatever it is. So whether it's in the manifestation of a relationship that is not necessarily making me feel good, but it's triggering me. It's triggering me to bring forth anything that needs to be healed within okay. me. But the infinite... Okay. analysis from every different right. angle keeps right. me, how do, how do you discern that? You know, I don't, I, I just know my own experience. As a student of the course, I read the book, I do the workbook exercises, and so I don't have to figure all this out. You know, you can't, I mean, I don't know, you, it's like you're saying, well, how do I figure out where's Jupiter supposed to go, and where's Pluto supposed to go, and then where's Saturn supposed to go? And can you, can, you, can you tell me then where Venus goes, and then where's the sun in relation to all this? When really the issue is no, when the universe is in its gravitational, when it's in correct gravitational alignment, those things fall into place. So that's why, you know, when someone once said to me, Marion, you make it so hard on yourself, and you're so hard on yourself because you're so easy on yourself. If you will, and what I would recommend to people who have such questions as yours, because the fact that you're here, if you resonate with anything I'm saying here, that means you resonate with the principles of the Course in Miracles. So it's not like I'm trying to sell you on the Course. The Course doesn't claim to be for everybody. But if these principles resonate with you, that does mean that you like the principles of the Course, because I'm like the Russian literature professor, right? So this means you do like Russian literature, okay? <laughs> So, what I would recommend to those of you who are having questions like this, if you feel moved, start doing the workbook of the Course in Miracles for 30 days. You know, maybe if you don't even feel like getting the book, get the app. And start doing the workbook for 30 days. If at the end of the 30 days, you just feel like it's not for you, I promise you it will not have been a waste of your time. And even if it's not for you, your having done that for 30 days will speed you along your journey, speed you along the path to the book or the teaching that is. These are, you can't, the Course in Miracles talks about how deep the hold of the ego is, and you can't do it without a teaching, without a teacher, but the Course in Miracles is talking about the internal teacher. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I have to go back and say something about Hillary Clinton because I might not have been compassionate enough. I think it's really beautiful that she gave um, a speech um, on love today, and I look forward to hearing it. <laughs> okay, tell the truth as soon as you know it, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Over there, there was somebody. Else. Oh, thank you. My God, so sweet. Thank you, darling. Thank you. I love you too. Thank you. Okay, wasn't there some? Weren't there some other people over here though? Real quickly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I do have two weeks left. Don't throw me out the door. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And then we're going over there. There's a gentleman. Okay, you have the mic, and then we'll go over there. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh. Th oh. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I'm listening to you. Um. So. I'm, um, I'm making a film about Ferguson called um, The Hope, Love, and Beauty Project, ironically enough, or not ironically enough, um, based on this, this work that we've been doing um, with A Course in Miracles, trying to bring a new conversation about how hope, love, and beauty can be present in the midst of tragedy. So mm -hmm. um, my struggle is um, what you talked about several weeks ago, which is that it's such a serious situation, what happened with Mike Brown, what happened with Darren Wilson, it's such a charged environment that, right. um, that to do that 
justice by speaking about it um, and yet at the same time trying to speak about what can be beyond it is, right. is, is something that's very difficult for me. I, I'm, I've shot most of it, but I'm, I'm kind uh -huh. of struggling with this mm -hmm. whole idea. And I'm, I've read the course and I'm, I'm doing the workbook, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to apply it to this particular right. situation because it's outside of me <laughs> in a way. You know? So we were talking tonight about the ego and how the ego operates. And The Course in Miracles says that the ego is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. And I also mentioned that collectives have ego as well. There is the collective shadow. And racism is one of the collective shadows of the United States. Now, an individual has to atone and a nation has to atone. This is why Abraham Lincoln in 1864, and you might want to look this up, in his, uh, when he established a National Day of Prayer and Atonement, said that a nation has to confess its sins as well. Uh, I wrote an article that, on Huffington Post a while about race and atonement and reparations and so forth. The United States, you know there was a, a pope, three popes ago, John Paul, who talked about the purification of memory and why it's so important to apologize. He went around atoning for the Catholic Church, for the Inquisition, and so forth. And he said that if you do not atone and confess and apologize in all the ways we're talking about, about character defects and so forth, then what happens is that you remain subconsciously unaware when you repeat the pattern. Too many Americans do not realize whether it's mass incarceration, whether it had to do with those three strikes and you're out, whether it has to do with so many of our social and economic policies, Many Americans simply do not realize how much these things are a legacy of slavery and a legacy of racism. Because too many Americans don't know the history, because too many Americans were not taught the history. But I think more Americans are, this is an area where I feel more Americans are waking up. And I, even though this kind of national atonement I don't think is going to come, it's interesting you talk about this, because like when Hillary Clinton met with the Black Lives Matter people, it was interesting because she did name that it was America's original sin. She did. But then where her thinking is, and maybe if she's president, we will all have an opportunity to, to inform, you know, to, I don't think I'm going to be invited, but somebody will, <laughs> to inform her that these answers have to be on the inside as well as legislative. Yes, she was right to say we needed Lyndon Johnson, but obviously we needed Martin Luther King. So I think that there is among the people more and more of a realization that atonement is necessary for two reasons. First, on a purely spiritual, metaphysical reason, if Germany had not done full mea culpa, including reparations after World War II to the Jews, I don't think Germany would be as high and as successful and abundant as it is now. That generation really took care of business. They really took care of business. With us, you know, you, you can look at the history, though, and you can understand it. It's not like from an emotional, psychological, spiritual perspective, if you actually look, and we don't have time now to go into it, but if you look, there was a civil war, and then Lincoln died, and then there were the carpetbaggers, and there was Ku Klux Klan, and then there was white supremacy, and then there was the lynching, and then the Jim Crow laws. You can, it, it's not like when you do look at it from a kind of psycho-spiritual perspective, what happened historically, you can see that we just never totally, totally took care of it. You you can understand that the, that the Northerners, I mean, 600,000 people died in, in the Civil War. I, I don't even have time to go into all of it, but you can understand the limits of former generations who had shed so much blood, but you can also see it's time for us to finally do this. It's, it, the sins of the fathers are passed on generation after generation after generation because we have not fully, as a nation, atoned. What would that look like? I mean, well, it's, it's I, you know, several years ago during uh, Newt, when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House, I remember a congressman from Ohio um, who, who, who suggested a uh, congressional apology for slavery. And I remember um, Newt Gingrich wouldn't even let it anywhere near the floor of the House, said, tell me how this will help one child learn how to read. I could tell him for all the reasons that the Pope said about purification of, of memory. We should have a, and these rituals are important. There should be an apology on a level such as that. There should be some kind of national apology on a level like that. There should, obviously there should be, we have on the mall a statue to Dr. King, but that's not enough. There should be a greater national recognition 
of slavery, of our history. We talk about black history, but isn't that interesting about black history? The issue here that's most important on this issue is white history, <laughs> right? Including just as with, with, in Ju uh, uh, with Judaism, there is the Museum of the Holocaust, Holocaust Museum, Museum of Tolerance. There should definitely be a slavery museum. This is why I also feel there should be reparations. Because, and even Bernie Sanders doesn't see this either, because it, it's, Bernie Sanders said, well, but we have, you know, if you just improve your economics, et cetera. Reparations, and once again, if you look at the reparations paid by the, by the Germans to the Jews, reparations is a powerful symbol, and it would be, let's say, 200 billion. People go, 200 billion dollars? I remind you, we spend 700 billion every year on defense. And you, uh, among the African American community, you, they pick their own leaders, African-American leaders would pick. It wouldn't be some paternalistic, we'll tell you how the money should be spent. Here's 200 billion or whatever. It's yours. We've apologized. Here are reparations. Do all the things. The thing about this that would be very hard for me to accept if I were an African-American. The issue of, of reparations is, has, by the 20th century, is just considered a civilized thing you do. That's why the Germans have paid billions in reparations to the Jews. Why, when it comes to African Americans, we act like it's some weird idea? I would find that offensive, actually. Does that make sense? When, and when you realize the whole psychic issue that these things exist year after year after year after year, and the apologies that are necessary, and you probably know the apologies that we've done here and that we continue to do here. So all of us, black and white, have to be involved in this. And, and what happens is, you, you had the Civil War, you had the Emancipation Proclamation, you had the amendment that abolished slavery, you had the abolition of slavery, and what those were were external remedies that abolished an evil institution. That's what that generation's job was. But those external remedies could not get rid, rid of racism, and that's our job. And I think with your movie, as you explore that and have more voices, one thing I will say about America, and I know this, and I know this from my own career, and I know this about Los Angeles, you start a new conversation, things happen, and you start a new conversation in, in Los Angeles, things happen. So God bless you with your movie. May it go very deep and go very wide. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm so sorry. If you need to talk to me, come at me after, but I, I'm being told we've got to get out of here. Is, there, is that okay? Is that something you can ask next week? Okay. Uh, we will be here next um, Monday, God willing, as my mother would say. And thank you very much for being here. And we will say our final prayer for the evening. As I said, I'm, I apologize if I communicated anything less than honor and compassion. Uh, for Hillary Clinton, and I, I will, be, and I mean that sincerely. I mean, and, you know, all you can do is catch yourself, and to really, and it's not that we have to agree with each other. We do not have to agree with each other. But I would be lying if I said that uh, I am without any personal animus on this issue whatsoever, <laughs> which you probably already knew. Okay, that's fine. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Joni, if you're watching, I bet you're laughing at me. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, as we leave this place tonight, first we take this opportunity to pray for each other and from the deepest parts of ourselves, wish each other well. May all of us feel your hand upon us, the mantle of your light upon us, and as we leave this place, may we carry this light to others. For Rachel and for Donna Jo, Victoria and her brother, CT and his family, for Daigu and for Paul, Eric and Maisie, for Shannon, for Lynn and for Ruth, for JB and Naomi, for the Deadman family, for Carolina and for Juan, Mary and Kathleen, Patricia and Darren, Matthew and Hannah and William, for Philippa, for Joni, for Tracy, for Eliza and for Charlotte. May the hand of God, dear God, be upon them all. And each of us now place in your hands our burdens 
and our decisions to be made, our hopes, our dreams, and our fears. And now we place in your hands, dear God, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Ben Carson, John Kasich, all of the people who are running for president. And we ask that you remove from our hearts any judgment that we have against any of them. In this moment, may we see the pure and innocent spirit of God which is you within them all. Remove from us our own darkness as you open our eyes to the truth in them. And from that place, dear God, guide us to wisdom. Where we disagree, may we disagree honorably. Where we feel a passion, may it be a passion for more than a passion against. May we be discerning, yet wise. May we be passionate, yet in all ways compassionate. As we place this presidential election, these congressional elections, our country itself, in your hands. Dear God, may all that democracy can be, be, and use each of us as citizens to bring forth the highest good. We take this opportunity to atone on behalf of our nation for racism, for militarism, for imperialism, for any aspects of our national personality, dear God, whereby we have collectively as a nation behaved in contradiction to your love. We do apologize on behalf of our nation for all the racist history in our country, slavery and onward, and pray for a reconciliation between races, a reconciliation among us all, a rebirth of freedom and a rebirth of love in our country and in our world. And so it is. Together, we all say, Amen. And do go forth with confidence and go forth with peace. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. There is a path of light already paved before you. Seek each day to walk that path. And if at any given moment you are stymied by fear, imagine an elder brother who is next to you and put out your hand for him as would a little child. He shall take it, for this is no idle fantasy. He is here. And so it is. We all say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you.